All right, I apologize for that. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Uh, let's see where we are. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share <laughs> share my screen so we can get started. And I apologize for the connection issues. Come on. So on on um Wednesday, but not Wednesday, on Friday, uh, we'll start working on the handout for this section. But for today, we're just gonna do like an introduction into uh stereochemistry and chirality. So let me let me share my screen and we'll get cracking. All right, so what's the day, the 24th? This month has flown by. All right, so we're gonna start out talking about um, stereochemistry and stereoisomerism. And before we talk about that, this the idea of isomerism, we're gonna kind of Deal with that for one for a second. So let me pull this image up. All right, so in this image, right, you can see that you have several compounds. If you look right here, this is C6H14. This is C6H14, and so is that. And if you count up the number of carbons, that's six carbons in each one of these. So one, two, three, three, four, five, six. And then here, one, two, three, four, five, six. You got six carbons in each one. So <laughs> these molecules, even though they have, if you notice, they got the same formula. Right? What's different about them? Anybody? Somebody help me out. What's different about these uh, compounds or these molecules? Feel free to unmute and answer that question. Don't put it in the chat because I can't see the chat. Right? What's different about these three compounds? Are they the same thing? Right? Will they have the same physical properties, same melting point, same boiling point? Uh, same freezing point, are they solids, liquids, gases? Like what's different about them? Going from that first compound to the third one. What do you notice? Right, if you, if you look at each one of those, they have the exact same formula, but they have a different structure. Right, same formula, different structure. They're not the same compounds. Each one of them is different. As a matter of fact, this is hexane. This is 2-methyl hexane. And this is one, two, three, four, two, two dimethyl butane. If you look them up, you'll see that they're not, uh, they're not the same at all. They all have, they're gonna have different boiling points. They're gonna have different melting points, different freezing points. Um, everything, but they have the same molecular formula. So if they got the same formula, but a different structure, we call these constitutional isomers. Right, they are constitutional isomers. 
same formula, different structure. Also, different physical properties. Right? If you look at the compounds on the bottom, you see the same thing. It's, the formula is C5H10O, but none of those are the same, right? They all have a different structure. So we call them constitutional isomers, right? So isomerism is not limited to constitutional isomers, right? There are, there's also another class of isomers that we call stereoisomers. Right, and under stereoisomers, we're gonna talk about <laughs> a couple of things. We're gonna talk about chirality. We're gonna talk about configuration. We're gonna talk about enantiomers. And we're gonna talk about diastereomers, right? One of the probably one of the earliest uh, uh, examples of stereoisomerism that you encountered in part one was the Newman projection. How many of you remember this? You're gonna have to unmute because I can't see your if your hand goes up and I can't see the chat. So if you right, if you remember from part one, this is a staggered Newman projection. And then that can we'll keep the back the same. That can rotate around the carbon carbon bond because this is a carbon right here. And then that back circle is also a carbon. So if you rotate around that carbon carbon bond, you'll see that you can draw it this way. where now the H's are on top of one another. The dihedral angle is different. So now this goes from staggered to eclipsed, All right? That's, the, that's probably the first <laughs> um, earliest example of stereoisomerism that you saw. So let's talk about first what a stereoisomer is, and then we're gonna talk about the different uh, definitions that apply to stereoisomerism. So we talked about when well, we use the term stereoisomer, but what that literally means is that you have the same molecular formula, but a different 3D orientation. Right, same molecular formula and structure. Nothing changes structurally. It's just the orientation of the atoms in space. Right, so the 3D orientation is the orientation of your atoms in space. That's what it means. That's what we mean when we say. Uh, 3D orientation, like how the atoms are arranged spatially. All right? Questions so far? Any questions about anything? All right. So this is an example. I'm going to use this example to, to flesh out our other definitions. This is an example of what we call of the Molecule. I think that's the, the name of it. Is it Paxlovid? Somebody help me out. The uh, uh, antiviral that's being used uh, for COVID patients. Is it Paxlovid? Yes. Okay. All right. So this is Paxlovid. All right. If you look at, let me look up what the um, the molecular formula is for that. Give me one second so I can Google it because I don't see my, oh, no, my, I got my phone right here. Actually, can somebody else look that up too? The molecular formula for Paxlovid.
I mean, we could count it up, but it's easy. It's faster to look it up. I found it. What is it? C23, H32, F3, N504. All right, cool. So it's got 23 carbons, 32 hydrogens, three fluorines, which you can see down here, uh, five nitrogens. You can see those here. I'm missing one. Five. And then four oxygens, right? So this this is a this is currently being employed right now, uh, given to patients with COVID. This molecule is an example of what we call a chiral molecule. Right? It has what we call handedness. We'll talk about handedness and what that means in a second. Right. What what I want you, what I want you to notice is that in Paxlovid, you have some lines. Some of the lines, if you can, if you can see them. They have a definition. You see how that's wedged, right? This is wedged. That's wedged, right? So those that those wedges mean something, right? Those wedges, those wedges indicate the three D orientation of the carbon where they exist, right? So this carbon right here is what we call a that color. It's what we call a chiral center. Right? Everywhere you see some type of definition, and it's not always uh, defined because sometimes it can be a chiral center, but you won't see a wedge or a dash. But that particular carbon is called what we call a chiral center. Another name for that is a stereo center, right? We're talking about stereo isomerism. So another name for a chiral center, we can also call it a stereo center. What I want you to notice also is that if the, if the, um, so if this bond here is on a wedge, by default, the, the fourth group on this carbon is gonna be on a dash. And in this case, it's a hydrogen. So that hydrogen is going back into the page. The wedge is coming out of the page, right? So if you were looking at this straight on, that wedge would be pointed right at you. And then the hydrogen would be pointed the opposite direction. So anytime you see a chiral center, if there's a wedged group, then the group that's not shown is understood to be on a dash. Are y'all following that? Because every carbon is a tetrahedron, right? So you have a, so you can have, you'll have a group here, that's group one, group two, group three, and then group four. So every carbon, in any molecule is going to be, if it's sp3 hybridized, it's going to be a tetrahedron, right? The, the geometry changes when you change hybridization states, but that's one of the criteria for chirality, which we're going to talk about. So that's what we call a chiral center, right? It has a definite 3D orientation. <laughs> and when we define chirality, right, we define it by four things. Right, we define it by the fact that the carbon is sp3 hybridized. That is non-symmetrical. Every chiral center has to meet these criteria. That is that the carbon or the atom, because you can have other atoms that are chiral that are not carbon, that is non-symmetrical that it is, it has four different substituents. Or four different groups attached. And the biggest one, let me just, I don't want to erase that. The biggest one is what's going to get us into talking about enantiomers and diastereomers, which is that it is non-superimposable 
it's a big word, but we're going to explain it and we'll understand it uh, before you leave. Non superimposable on this mirror image. Right? So if you took, if you drew the mirror image of Paxlovid and you took that because the mirror image does exist. It's not just imaginary. There, that for every stereo isomer, there's a mirror image that we call the enantiomer, right? So let me let me add that in down here. So when we talk about the mirror image, what we're saying is that Right, the enantiomers can't be superimposed. Now, and we'll define enantiomers shortly. Right, so for something to be a chiral center, it has to meet these four criteria. It's got to be sp3 hybridized. It's got to be non-symmetrical. It's got to have four different things on it, which means that it's non-symmetrical, and the mirror image must be non-superimposable. All right, so that that chiral center that we highlighted. It's just one of many chiral centers in this molecule, right? You can see on this carbon. <laughs> and, and before we do that, let's go back and look at the, the qualities, right? And see if they match. So is that carbon sp3 hybridized? This is where your working knowledge of part one comes in, right? You gotta have a working knowledge of part one. There's some fundamental ideas and concepts from the first part of organic that you just cannot forget and uh, hybridization is one of them. So is that carbon uh, sp3 hybridized? And how do you know if it's S sp3 hybridized? Like, how can you tell? I don't all speak out at once and break the internet, but I, we need somebody to speak out. How do you know something of a carbon is sp3 hybridized? Like, what's the, what's the, um, What's the criteria for something to be SP3? Anybody? Um, I, I can't really I'll remember all the way, um, but is it has something to do with the shells? Okay, it does. Uh, the um, orbital uh, around isn't all the atomic <laughs> orbitals uh, combined to give you four sp3 hybrids. Yes, that's exactly right. So you got four hybrids. So that means that a carbon that's sp3 hybridized is going to have four single bonds because every carbon has four bonds, but they can be in different arrangements, right? You can have two singles and two doubles. Uh, I mean, two singles and a double. You can have a triple bond and a single bond. But an sp3 hybridized carbon is going to have four single bonds to it. And if you look at that carbon that we highlighted, <clears throat> that we're using as our example, it indeed has four things attached to it by a single bond. So this carbon is attached. This hydrogen is a group that's attached. This carbon over here is attached to it. And so is that one. Right? So you have four different groups, that, four things attached, and they're all different. And that particular carbon is not symmetrical because it's got four different things attached to it. It's sp3 hybridized. And if we drew the mirror image of that chiral center, it would not be superimposable. So let's let's do that. So we're gonna we're gonna carve out that particular piece of uh, Pax Paxlovid, and we're gonna draw the mirror image. So I'm gonna draw it how it is first. And then I'll draw the mirror image. So let me see. It's a five member ring. It's got a nitrogen here. Come on, Wilson. Right. It's got a double bond, a carbonyl at the top. And so we're going to just draw this part. This is wedged. All right, and then I'm just gonna abbreviate that. I'm not gonna draw the rest of it, and this is dashed, okay? So that is that fragment, 
Any, is there anything else attached to that? No, that's it. All right. If I wanted to draw the mirror image of this, <clears throat> I would draw it like I would put a, this is the, the easiest way to draw it is to put a mirror plane here. And we're gonna say that this is the mirror image. All right, and I'm gonna draw it. If you look at yourself in the mirror, you're not gonna see your back. You're gonna see what's facing you. So I'm gonna draw it like this. So this is H, that's N. That's double bond O, oh, and this is still wedged. All right? Qu any questions about that? It's just like it's looking at itself in the mirror. And the, the let me fix that. It's a sloppy. This little piece right here, that's my mirror plane. Any questions about that? So the, the last criteria to be met to determine if that center is chiral is whether or not we can superimpose the mirror images, right? What that means is, can I take the mirror image, which is right here, and flip it over so that all the atoms line up, right? And everything will, will fit. Everything will lay on top of each other. Like, that's all that means. If, Matter of fact, if you take your left hand and I'm gonna turn my camera back on for a second. I can't see myself. No more. Let's see. All right, if you take your left hand and hold it up like this, take your right hand and hold it up like that, right? Your left hand and right hand are mirror images. If you take your right hand and try to lay it on top of your left hand, trying to get that uh, shadow out. You can see that your thumbs don't line up, your pinkies don't line up, so on and so forth. So your hands are not superimposable, right? So we're gonna take this image and we're gonna flip it over. All right, that's all I'm gonna do. Take It's like if you were to put a spatula underneath it and turn it like a pancake, right? Or another way to think about it is to put an axis through here and just rotate around that axis. That's all we're doing when we talk about superimposing. All right, it sounds like it sounds complicated, but it's really just turning the molecule over and laying it on top of the original image with all the atoms lined up. Now, what do you think is gonna happen? To the chiral center. When I turn this thing over, so now you if you notice. The nitrogen is now facing the same direction, right? The carbonyl doesn't change. What's gonna to happen to that, that wedge if I flip this over? What do you think is gonna to happen to it? It's gonna become a dash. It's gonna turn, it's gonna go back, isn't it? When you flip it over, the wedge is gonna be pointed back and then the dash is gonna be pointed forward. So when I flip that over, <laughs> it's gonna look like this, right? Where this is now, Hydrogen is now on a dad on a wedge. I'm sorry, and then the other group, come on, Russell, tighten up. Is going to be on a dash, like so, right? And that's because I took it and I turned it over. Now, if you took those two and laid them on top of each other, would would all the atoms match up? They wouldn't. The carbonyl, the nitrogen, yes, but the chiral center would be opposite, right? Because I, for the mirror image, if it's chiral, the mirror image and the original image are not going to be superimposable. That's what that means. I can't take my left hand and lay it on top of my right hand or my right hand lay it on top of my left hand and get all my fingers to line up. That's all that's saying, right? So for that, that center, that is a chiral center. Are we following that? Any questions about that? Please ask. You're paying, paying good money to ask questions. So ask all the questions you need to ask. Um, I'm confused on how those two got switched, the um, hydrogen and the atom. And the, the... And the other atom, the, car, the carbon that's on the wedge? Yes. <laughs> okay, do this. Take your fist and ball it up like that with your thumb pointed away from you. 
Follow okay. me. Now, mm -hmm. I want you to rotate it around. Now, which way is your thumb pointed? Okay. It's the opposite uh, direction, right? Right. So when I take that molecule and I wrote, I'm rotating the whole thing in space, right? The whole thing, mm -hmm. not just the stereo center, but I'm taking the whole molecule and I'm turning it over. So anything right. that's facing out, when I flip it over, is going to end up facing back. Anything that's facing back is going to end up facing outward. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Other questions about that? So is, is that center and Pax Lovett, that one center that we've singled out, is it chiral? Can we say that that's a chiral symbol? It is sp3 hybridized. It is non-symmetrical. You have four different things attached to that car that uh, carbon, and we just proved down here that the mirror image and the original image are different, right? You can't superimpose them. Are y'all following? Yes, no. Yeah, that's a chiral yes. center. Yeah, so it is chiral. All right. That's the point. That's the point. Right, and there are multiple chiral centers in here. Let's identify them. Is this carbon right here chiral? I'm just going to highlight it. I need a different color. Is that chiral? Yes or no? And how do you tell? First thing you're looking for is if it's sp3. Right. After that, you can think about the other things. If it's not sp3 hybridized, you can skip it. Yes, it's sp3. There's it's supposed SP3. to be a hydrogen. Where, where would the hydrogen be? Is, if that if this group right here is that's a bad example there. If that's on a wedge, where's the hydrogen and which way is it pointing? It's on a dash. On a dash, on the same carbon. Is that right? Yeah. So we're gonna put it here. Point it back. Anytime you don't see that fourth atom, it's understood to be hydrogen. And if it's on a carbon that has a group that's on a wedge, it's understood that the hydrogen is on a dash. <clears throat> the reason it's not shown is for efficiency, right? Because it takes up a lot of space when you draw molecules and you got all these uh, hydrogens showing. So anytime you have a skeletal, skeletal structure like this, you don't need to show the hydrogens. All right, so where are my four groups on that chiral center? <laughs> we know nitrogen is going to be one, is that right? It's going to be nitrogen. It's one group. Mm -hmm. This carbon down here is a group, is that right? Mm -hmm. Hydrogen is a group. Yeah. And then this carbon over here, that's my fourth group. So, so that's that. Uh, meets the criteria of being sp3 hybridized, having four different things attached, uh, being non-symmetrical, and we can you can tell if it has if it meets those four things, the fifth is more than likely going to be true. I mean, um, if it meets those three criteria, the fourth one is going to be true in that you can't superimpose uh, the mirror image, but we can we can show it if you want. I, I think we should. Okay, show us. Good. Good. Thank you for, for taking the challenge. All right. So let, I'm going to draw it just like it is. So this is on a wedge. This is a nitrogen. We got a hydrogen on a dash. We got a triple bond pointed down here. And it's actually a nitrile. And we have a group over here. We're just going to call this uh, carbon. All right, what would the mirror image look like? I'm gonna put a mirror plane right here. What does it look like? All right, the easiest way is to draw what you see. So I'm gonna put this, this carbon, if it's looking at itself in the mirror, you look at yourself in the mirror, you're gonna see your nose, right? So this would be considered the nose. So when I look at it, when it's looking at itself in the mirror, I'm gonna draw it just like I see it. This is still here, right? This is still wedged. 
if you switch it in the mirror image, when you flip it over, it's gonna be wrong. It's gonna be identical. So you gotta draw it exactly how it is. All right, so this is wedged. And then the hydrogen is still on a dash. Everybody okay with that? <clears throat> yes, sir. All yes. right, now, how do I show this? How do I test the, for superimposability? I need to take the mirror and rotate it. Are y'all following? So I'm gonna take it, put a spatula underneath it and flip it over. That's all I'm doing. Or I put an axis through here and then I'm just gonna rotate that way. All right. <clears throat> I'm gonna move this down on another page. Okay, so what 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 would that look like? This is still gonna be here. That's not gonna change, right? That carbon is gonna come here. Is that right? This carbon right here is now here. And then what about the nitrogen and the hydrogen? What is that going to look like? Which one is wedged? And which one is going to be wedged? And which one is going to be dashed? So the hydrogen would be wedged and the nitrogen would have the dash. Good. Excellent. Excellent. That's exactly right. Now, if you took this and tried to lay it on top of this, would it work? Would, would everything line up? Look, what, look at the nitrogen. Aren't they in two different positions? Spatially, one is going back into the page and one is coming out of the page. Is that right? Yeah. Look at the yeah. hydrogens. The hydrogens are opposite as well. So when you try to lay these two on top each of each other, not gonna happen, right? Because you got two groups that are not going to align. Is that is that making sense? That's what it means to be superimposable. Like you take your your two molecules, you lay them on top of each other, and everything matches. Um, what molecules are superimposable? Great question. Great question. Let me let me. So let's say I have something like this. This is a good, that's an excellent question. So I have something like this, right? And these are both CH3s. I'm, I'm drawing it wedged because I wanna make the point, right? So you got two CH3 groups on there. And then if you look at the mirror, we can draw it out. Right. If we flip that one over, the, the methyl groups are going to be, come on, Russell, dashed. Is that right? Yes. If I rotate yeah. this around, rotate it that way. But if you look at the top group, all I all I have to do for that. I could rotate this around and I'm gonna get the exact same molecule. I'm gonna get this. Let's, let, me, let me not bunch that in there like that. This is A. Is that right? Can I, can I take that? Do you see if I took A and flipped it over, I can, those methyl groups will be dashed also? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the reason why it's superimposable is because of the symmetry. You can see that this is symmetrical. You got the same groups on both sides. If you cut it in half, there's a mirror plane like right here, right? 
So this is symmetrical. So you'll, if it's symmetrical, <laughs> then it's gonna end up being superimposed. I hope that answered your question. I don't know who that was that asked that question. But I hope that was me, Asia, it did. it did. Okay, all right. So we know that this is a chiral center also, right? It is, it meets all four criteria. That's also a chiral center. Right, and this molecule has multiple chiral centers. Where can, let, let's identify the other ones, uh, and then we can talk, start talking about another or two other concepts. Where are the other chiral centers in this molecule? Anybody, help me out. Um, there's one right. Where there's a wedge right here on the left. Yes. Okay. Good. What about um what about here? What's the problem there? It's got three of the same groups. Three. Thank you. Kudos to you for that, for saying that. It's got three of the same groups, so it doesn't have four different groups. But this is chiral. Is that right? What about up here? That's some wedges up here. Let's look, let's take this carbon for instance, right here. Is that is that carbon a chiral center? <clears throat> is that not symmetrical? Got the same thing on both sides. If I chop it right here down the middle, isn't it the same on both sides? I'm talking about for this carbon now. Uh, but it doesn't have different um, or different molecules on there. Yeah. Let's see. Because <clears throat> we got we do have a, a bit of an issue. And the issue is right here. Right? This carbon and this carbon are different. So even though, even though when we look at that at face value, we might immediately think symmetry, right? But when we compare these two carbons, which are, in, in, okay, so let me back up. Let's look at this as a, 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 as a potential chiral center. It's got a hydrogen here. It's got a carbon here. It's got a carbon here. And it's got another carbon over here. When we look at the other side, <clears throat> It has a hydrogen here, a carbon here, a carbon here, and a carbon here. The two carbons down here are not the same. And that one bit of asymmetry is the difference in those two carbons being chiral or achiral. Are y'all following it? Yes, sir. Because yeah. that one piece of asymmetry means that now the carbon on the right here, my right, is it has four different groups attached to it. And the carbon on the left, because that carbon down there is different, it has four different groups attached to it. So those two carbons are actually chiral, even though they look it looks symmetrical at first glance. But when you look at the overall structure, it's not. Does that make sense? Yes. All right, let me ask you this question. <laughs> Which way are those bonds going? Um, those carbon carbon bonds right here, these carbon carbon bonds. Which direction are they going? Sorry for that fat highlighter, but you got it. Which which direction are they, are they facing? If the two hydrogens are coming out on a wedge, what's the default position for those two carbons? Even though they're drawn on a straight line. Are they in the back, like they're angled they're pointed, to the? They're pointed to the back, yes. And you'll be surprised that that five-member ring, let me see if I can 
it actually, I'm just going to draw it kind of 2D. It's kind of like this, right? Where these are the hydrogens. And then this is the back ring right here. Right? It's actually kind of folded like that. Because it's a 3D structure, right? But that's beside the point. So we got, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but we do have two other chiral centers up here, here and here. So that's one, two, three, four, five. Am I missing one? Six, right? That's six chiral centers. <laughs> We're following? Yes. So it has a total of six chiral centers. Now here's the, here's the other part of this that makes this molecule even more remarkable or whoever made it or isolated it. They, it I, I'm not sure about the origin. I'm not sure if it's synthetic and they actually pieced it together or if, they, if it's biologically synthesized where they isolated it from some fungus that's able to, able to generate it as a, a metabolite or a secondary metabolite, I'm not sure about that. But here's the other part of this that makes this more remarkable, right? Because the overall molecule itself is, is chiral because of the chiral centers, right? There are multiple stereoisomers. Right? And the way we determine how many stereoisomers are possible for a given molecule is to use this little equation, this little bootleg equation, two to the n, where n is the number of chiral centers. All right, n is the number of chiral centers. So for this molecule, you have two to the n or two to the sixth possible stereoisomers. That's 32 stereoisomers, is that right? Yes or no? So you got 32 possible stereoisomers but this is the only one that works. Isn't that something? Like every, every anytime you take a, a drug, a legal drug, not an illegal drug, anytime you take any prescription medication, any type of uh, a drug, if it's chiral, more than likely, there's one isomer that you're dealing with and not multiple isomers. If you take multiple isomers, you end up sick. But the fact that this is, this config, all, all these chiral centers here have their own specific configuration. That means that this is the isomer, a stereoisomer of Paxlovid that can bind to the COVID virus, however it binds, whatever pathway it disrupts. This is the only one that works out of 32. So that means that if you're a synthetic chemist like me, when you're making this, you have to make it with specificity. You have to make it so that each chiral center is set the way that it is, right? You can't, it can't be another stereoisomer that you're taking. It has to be this one. <clears throat> Dr. Russell? Go ahead. I did, it's 64. Is it 64? Two, isn't two it six. six? Two to the six? I'm tripping. It's 64. That's even, that's even more remarkable. Thank you for, for, for that correction. That's even more remarkable. One isomer out of 64 is the one that works to disrupt COVID, uh, some pathway in COVID to keep it from replicating. It's crazy, All right? But, that, but that's how we determine <clears throat> the number of stereoisomers. We have to know how many chiral centers are present. If we know that, then we can extrapolate from that how many isomers are possible. That makes, that makes the design and the synthesis of these types of compounds even more remarkable that you get a single stereoisomer or that you can make a single stereoisomer 
that has the, the, the right properties to do whatever antiviral thing it does, right? I want you to look up, and I'll post this as a, a little extra credit assignment. I'll put it in Blackboard. I want you to look up, um, what's the name of this compound? Uh, I'll just, I'll post it, because I know we got to go with two minutes over. I'll post it to Blackboard. I want you to look it up, and I want you to um, tell me which, why once a single stereoisomer is important as far as like for health applications, right? But I'll, I'll, I'll frame it up so you'll know exactly what to do. Uh, and it'll come to me as soon as I log off more than likely, but that's okay. All right, any questions about anything else? Uh, I have one. Go ahead. Um, will this video 